So, so that all happened, and Jerry Grinelli and uh, the music, the sound thing, I was involved with symphony orchestras, dance performers, theater people, people we would never have met. Yeah. Except for the, I mean, who knew? Who knew that I made anchors here for years? Yeah. Anchors and propeller screens and all kinds of stuff. And then I get to make sound, and uh, we have a composer in London, England, Peter Weigold, he's internationally famous. He loves Nova Scotia. <clears throat> he's like us, he has this romantic thing about coming to Nova Scotia. And uh, he sat in our little gallery, and he, he saw my, this big thing I was making out here, this, it's called Volcanus Eruptus, a strange thing, powerful sound generating thing. And he said, whatever you build, I will compose for. This is a, an internationally known <laughs> classical composer. Wow. Now, he ends up in my shop. We had an opera singer from New York City, Rindy Eckhart, come in here and sing into these things. Wow. See, I, it, this is impossible, <laughs> but there it is. So I feel, I feel like, um, I've, I've said this many times, I feel like when I landed in Nova Scotia, it was like I was put on a set of iron rails. And I really didn't have many choices. I always felt like this is where you're going, <laughs> you know. And, and all these people come in. Chinese, an old Chinese photographer, the late George Lin, out of nowhere shows up in our yard. We're loading wood. This car comes down the driveway very fast and stops. And he's in the passenger seat, tiny, tiny, very old, very sick. Chinese man, his niece is driving. He opens the door and he gets out and he puts his hand out and he said, my name is George. And I shook his hand and I, can, I can't tell you what that felt. The air was thick with electricity. I just knew something and it was. He said, I've been an amateur photographer all my life. I'm old, I'm sick, I'm terminally ill. And before I die, I want to put together a series of black and white art photographs of your forged surfaces. Wow, how did he find you? He was on a, the previous two weeks, he was on a trip with his niece to Cape Breton. And uh, on a, he's taking pictures. And he uh, stopped at a craft store. He said, we, we never stop to buy crafts. We don't do those things. But I felt I had to stop here. And he saw this little candle holder that was forged by my daughter, Becky, yeah. who lives just down the road. A beautiful little thing. It has a sort of forged uh, steel, sort of protecting the flame, burning in here. It's very pretty. They wanted $100 for it. He said, that's too much money. He got the car and they went. And the guy, they got all the way to uh, the causeway. And he said to his niece, Patty, turn around, go back. We have to have that. He went and bought it. <laughs> Two days later, he's in Westover, taking pictures, staying at the B&B over there, and uh, discovers that Becky's father, the blacksmith, is just across the water over yeah, there, yeah. and that's when he came down our driveway. Yeah. So what he wanted to do, I'm just standing there, and I, I, this has happened to me over and over and over again. And I always keep my arms wide open, the doors wide open, because it's never failed these people come into our lives and it's just, he says, I want to take extreme close-ups, this much surface area, extreme close-ups of these four surfaces and see what I can find. And I had nothing to sell them. I had a show on in Kentville, so all the pieces were out. Uh, but I had this scrap pile in the corner and I said, well, come over here, let's look. And he said, can I look at the, help yourself. I went back to loading wood. <laughs> well, about an hour later, he comes out and he says, John, and I went over, and he had this uh, three pieces. He said, can I buy these? And I said, sure, sure, make me an offer. He said, $100? And I said, that's way, way too much. How's 60? Okay. Can I look for some more? Sure. <laughs> so back to Woody Wood. He calls me over. He's got a mountain of stuff. I said, oh, <laughs> well, I had sort of plans for some of these, you know. Uh, 
I don't know, uh, $300? Okay. So those are in the trunk. They go away. And I'm sitting there wondering, what just happened here? Because I could feel it. I'll show you pictures of George. Oh, my God, what a man. What a man. Uh, anyway, so, next morning, right at 9 o'clock, the clock struck 9, the doorbell rang. It's Patty, and George is in the car. She stands there and she says, He's gone crazy. He was up all night last night, pacing the floor. He's obsessed with this project. He needs more, much, much more. I said, help yourself. And they get another big pile, another $300. I mean, I keep my back to the, I still, I always keep my back to the wall. It's not that I'm crazy or anything like that, but I, but I just, I know that this is going to be good, right? So a CD comes in the mail. I put it in the computer and I, I just about, I'll show you. It's just, I, I, it's, I, can't, I still haven't gotten over that. I've been looking at, I've, I forge stuff all the time. I mean, I, I forge shapes. I mean, you saw that other thing, but yeah. what, what has yeah. always driven me crazy is the beauty of yeah. the surface. Right. It's the surface. And it's not all banged up or anything like that with, to make marks that make it look handmade or anything stupid like that. This is just the record of how the shape right. was made. And if you know the process at all, you can sort of see it and feel it. So that's what I've been looking at at that time for 40 years with incredible interest. I mean, I, this, is, this is my obsession is the surface and these shapes, but the surface. And here comes this old Chinese guy out of the blue and shows me stuff I've never seen before. And, and it, it turned into a series of books. We put out insights, I'll show you, insights, mm -hmm. and then insights two and insights three, all based on forged surfaces. Mm -hmm. And all accomplished, we had a show in Halifax at the uh, uh, Swickers Gallery. Oh, yeah. Uh, in Muncaster. George, George lived in the South End with his sister. And George, I, I don't understand the fascination with pug dogs, but people who <laughs> love pugs love pugs. He had this beautiful dog named Fu, and George made these outfits out of scrap materials, leather and stuff for his pug. And they were, I mean, it sounds so corny, but they were really something. People say when George Ling walks his dog, traffic stops. <laughs> so he's out walking his dog one day, and he sees this white guy coming towards him. It's Ian Muncaster. He has a pug. So they stop and start talking. And one thing leads to another. And George tells him about this book project. And Ian says, Swickers Gallery has never had a photographic exhibit in our history. It's the oldest gallery in Canada. Uh, but you're going to be the first. Wow. So we had a book launch there and a, and a show. And uh, George, uh, uh, all of a sudden, he had so much energy. And he was so alive. But all of a sudden, you could see he was being beaten. And I think he was 83 when he died, or 86, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But, mm -hmm. but he managed to see his final book uh, on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we were teaching in Ontario at the time. I, I, wasn't, I couldn't be here, but a friend who was with him at the time, he, he, looked, he said, George, look through every picture. He, the, the books were all George Ling photography. John Little Ironwork. And I said, George, I, I, I appreciate the gesture. This is very kind of you, but George, this is your baby. You just used some stuff that I had around the shop. He said, no, he absolutely refused to budge. And if you open the first book, it, it says George Ling is a photographer living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. John Little is a blacksmith living in East Dover, Nova Scotia. <laughs> they are friends. Wow. So, yeah, amazing. Over and over and over again. Yeah. So, you're you're, you're t talking to a happy camper. Yeah. yeah, I feel unbelievably fortunate. So, so anyway. All right. So, so what is this about? So this is this is a. Uh, this is what Uncle Willie had. Well, it's it's, it's uh, Willie. Uh, we've written a lot of stuff about Uncle Willie, and I want you to read it one of these days. Uh, 
he's, he was enormously important to me, but not so much as a blacksmith, but uh, as a person. And, and I, there's something I, I would never want to trade places with him. I could not live the way he had lived his life. But my, my, my respect for, I'll never meet another human being like him. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. So, but he, he uh, when I got these, my first power hammer, I went over to see Willie and I, I tried to explain to him how I could heat up all these anchor shanks and punch the holes for the rings. I could heat them up and as fast as I could heat them, I could punch the hole and put the ring in. And it was, it was a revolution. And I could see that he was completely, he, he, he could not understand what my hurry was. <laughs> what, what, you know, it was, what, what, why are you doing that? I said, I can do all this, like, time, time meant nothing no, to, to him. No. He worked on that bobsled for th two or three years, I know, and it finally got done, but it took three years. Yeah. The big piece of oak that he had to saw, I don't know if you're ever in there, he had a, two saw horses, and it was a, I think it was a four by 12, and he needed two four by sixes, so he was ripping it end to end. Yeah. And he had it on the saw horse, and as he walked by, he would go, shh, shh, and he'd go and do something over there, and he'd come back, shh, shh. Two years later. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, so anyway, what happens here is there's a blower outside, yeah. electric blower, you can hear that. Yeah. And if I pull this lever, the air comes up, from underneath the fire to fan the fire through those holes there. Yeah, I see that. So I'm going to get some coals out of the hole. Uncle Willie's was a, a bellows. Well, he had a bellows and then he had a he had an electric blower. Yeah, yeah. And a double, th yeah. I think it's called a double post, double throw electric switch, like out of the Frankenstein movies. <laughs> and you, and you took the same, you had to touch the right thing. <laughs> and it would go spark and the blower would come on. I met him later than you remember him in the earlier times. Yeah. But that's the bellows right there. That's what I had for seven years. We had no electricity here for seven years. It's a green coal because it's raw. Can you see that at all? Yeah. That's bituminous coal, the soft coal, but very high quality. Okay. And blacksmiths like soft coal because it cokes. So when you heat it, and all the volatiles get driven off. This is like charcoal. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the mineral equivalent of charcoal from wood. Uh, so this is pure, pure, more or less pure carbon. That's where the heat is. I can get 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit right there. I can vaporize steel right there. That's how much energy is in that. Mm -hmm. We'll get a little puff back here for a little bit. Alarmed. Okay. If you've been in the lease, you, you, you've already got your immunity. <laughs> How he breathed all that stuff. Oh, well, you can hardly see in there sometimes. Uh, Nancy used to say it. She couldn't stay in there for five minutes. I used to, I spent many days there. But it was always... I always felt like I, you know, this is not a good thing. <laughs> It wasn't a good thing. No, it wasn't. So you're going to show us some tools? It's familiar with the anvil. Oh, yeah. That's uh, a, yeah. This is a pretty large anvil. This is, um, I think it's 440 pounds. It's, it's a big for this. A 200-pound anvil is more than you need. It's nice to have a bigger one because if the anvil moves when you're working, it moves because energy from your body is going into the anvil. And what you want is all the energy to go into the work. So uh, the bigger and better anchored the anvil is, you could put a pint of beer on here and work all day, and it would still sit, sit there, and you'd be hammering as hard as you can all day. So that's what you want. All the energy comes back into the metal, because it's hitting up as you hit down, sort of. What you do as you make things, I mean, if you want to understand the, the process, if this material is like clay, it, it behaves just like plasticine. I practice, I do a lot of practicing with shapes with plasticine. 
and you make shapes and you uh but you can't touch the hot metal obviously. No, I guess not. So, <laughs> so this is one of the things that I make. It's a it's called a bottle cap lifter. Uh, this will the jaw will be forged into a hook and the horns will be curled around like this and then this will be hammered out like this and we'll have a triangle at the end and in the end it'll be shaped sort of like that and that's the handle they come right and left-handed and you bite off the bottle cap <laughs> right I've, I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these but to make this you you heat the material up to that light yellow heat and you put the, the piece in the vise. The vise is, this is almost as important as the anvil. Yeah. And you tighten that up really tight. And then you put this in the end. And that's how you make the, the nose. Okay. I mean, and so forth in the eyes. So, so it's, it's, so this, this, if you made this out of plasticine, you might use a pencil to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Pencil won't work on this. No. So this is what you make. You make a thing you like this. That? I made almost everything here. Oh. Yeah. As you need it, you make it, and then hopefully you wear it out and make another one that's a little bit different. That <laughs> means that your work is always different because the tool changes. There's another thing that's maybe a little bit curious about how I approach this stuff is that um, as I'm working on something like this, uh, if it starts going in a unexpected direction because I, I made a mistake, say, uh, I change the design. I don't go back and do it over again until until I get it right. I change the design so it has to fit the design. <laughs> Dave so, Weitzman uh, was an artist of mine. He said, "Never fight the painting. If it's, it'll tell you how to go." That's that's a great line. That's exactly the same idea. You understand? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And I remember one day I was out on um Umlaw Road, and I, there was a road and a and a fence and a gate. And I said, I'm gonna take a photo, a photo of that. I'm gonna paint that. Yeah. And I went home, and the the field in the back became a a, a lake. The road became a brook, <laughs> a river. Yeah. The fence I didn't put in, yeah. and I took it into the gallery. I whipped it off in no time. It just fell together. Yeah. And I took it into the gallery. It didn't even get up and hung on the wall. It was on the floor when I sat it down, and somebody came in before they hung it on the wall bottom. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so I learned that lesson it, from him. But it didn't fall together. That's that. That's that informed intuition. Okay. That's that deep well. That's you've been building, digging that well for a long time. <laughs> And then it just came out, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where it's, that's the magic. Ah. That's why we, we end up doing this, right? It's, I love it. You know, uh, yeah, I can uh, see that. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's what you're talking about, right? People yeah. do things because they love it. Well, well yes. you can't lose, you know. This, this is a very forgiving medium. I can't do anything with wood. That's too complicated for me. And people say, what? Yeah, but you know, if you make a mortise and tenon joint in wood, to me, that's magic. Yeah. Everything has to be so precise. Yes, but you know, I make boards and tendon joints of steel all the time. Hot steel. You do it with hot steel? That's impossible. Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't tell everybody this now. <laughs> it's easy as pie. You make the mortise. You roughly punch the tenon in hot metal. You cool the hot metal. You take the mortise and heat it up really hot. Stick it in and hammer on the end. It's got to fit. <laughs> I used to be a pressman, and I, one of our presses broke, and we had a guy that was a machinist. Yeah. And he said, I hate wood. <laughs> <laughs> it splinters, it splits, it cracks. It, it, it's metal, you, it doesn't move. It's still alive. <laughs> yeah. The wood is still alive. <laughs> it's terribly frustrating. Well, this is a nice looking fire. So now you're getting what we want for a fire. I'm going to get a little bit more coal here because I see my supply is pretty low. You put the coal around the edge of the fire, and then you sprinkle water on that. Are you serious? Yeah, because what that does is encourages it to form coke. Because what happens, and you won't even be able to observe it, what happens is that the, uh, the coal, the green coal, as it heats up, gets sort of gooey. And 
asphalty. It looks like tar, road tar. Mm -hmm. And that's and, and then it starts to knit together, and that's called coalescing. That's where the word comes from. It coalesces into coke, and that's what you want. The, the green coal is not very hot. Wow. Who learned all this? Yeah, yeah, isn't that wonderful? People learned it by playing with it. But who would ever think of such a thing? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, the first step was charcoal, which is why Europe was denuded. It was all because they cut down the forest to make charcoal to make iron. It was the only way to make iron. Then they discovered coal. And that's when our troubles began, right? Well, except, of course, Europe had no forests at that time. So I can regulate the amount of air however I want it. When you're working, you heat the metal, and as you take the metal out of the fire, you turn off the. And you do How long does it take to uh, heat metal? Not very long. I'll show you in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get Nancy out here too. You, you have to get a, a picture of Nancy striking for me. Okay. It's really neat. I'll, I'll give her a glass right now. What's that? It's a little buzzer. I don't know whether it's still working or not. Uh, it rings a little buzzer doorbell type thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, have, we have a whole series of codes. <laughs> I have to, I, I never did it the memory. See it. There's a list back here. Three shorts followed by a short is food in a half hour. Three shorts followed by two shorts, food in ten minutes. Three shorts, food is ready. Long, short, long, come here. Uh, a series of shorts is tsunami coming. A series of long, big tsunami is coming. <laughs> we got it all worked out. Okay. Do you know where the kids are? That was one of them. I don't know where the kids are. <laughs> I, I have to say, this time of year I get a little bit nostalgic. I remember I used to always make little kids, and they, they knew which Christmas presents came from Daddy because they were all magnetic and heavy. <laughs> and I would be forging way out here, and the three little girls would uh, wiggle along the side of the shop, and I'd, I'd be working away on their pre Christmas presents, and I'd look up, and there'd be three little heads spying on me. Yeah. I'd look up, and they'd go, Phew! <laughs> so, so, you three, how many so this, children you have? Oh, look at that! So that's just a few seconds now. That, that's that's not real hot, though. That's really hot. That's not real hot. How, how many children do you have? Three, three daughters. Three daughters. Becky, the youngest, is 42 now. I can't believe I that. I can't either. I, I just this is the only one I met. Yeah. Well, I met her at years. She's a really good blacksmith. Really good blacksmith. Uh, a little bit busy now with three kids. I was looking at her webpage, or uh, you know, her Facebook. So now, page. see that sparks? Yeah. That's that is the metal burning. That what you're looking at the well, it stopped sparking now, but that when it was sparking, that's oxidizing. So that's steel oxidizing. It's burning. It's not hot up there. No, this does, it takes a long time to get up here. It's not copper. It's, it's, it's steel. But that, that light yellow is the color that we want, and I'll show you a few basic things here. So, if you, if you take the metal out of the fire, and put it on the anvil, and hit it straight down, the metal moves regularly. It squishes down that way, that way, that way, this way. But if you put it over the horn of the anvil, and hit here, it's, it squeezes the metal that way, yeah. very little this way. If you put it here and hit it, it makes it wider this way. If you hit with the cross pin of the hammer, it moves it this way, but very little this way. And if you hit with the face of the hammer, this is what you're never ever, ever able to observe as I'm hammering, and I'm trying to make a scroll say, that's what I'll do with this thing. So I'll, I'll flatten it out and make it wide. But what you can't see is sometimes I'm hitting just like that. And that's that curved surface, mm -hmm. which is pushing, pushing the metal in the way I want it to go. So that's the business. And all these tools 
my tools that I made to punch a square hole. You punch it right into, this is cold. Mm -hmm. cold. These are all called set tools. You set them on the metal and you hit the tool. So you can punch a square hole with that, a round hole with this. You can uh, punch a slot with that. Um, this is a hardy for cutting material off. Square on one side, sloped on the other side, and so forth and so on. You just put them as you need them. Uh, this is called a flatter for smoothing out any ugly lumps that you left on, on the metal by forging it. Uh, and they all, they're, they're blacksmithing tools are all like this. And the ha handles, interestingly, are not usually fixed. They're, they're, uh, they're loose because inevitably this gets hot and gets buggered up. This is an old ball peen hammer that I made into a punch. <laughs> Usually I start with a piece of tool steel, but that's what I do with this, you can see. You can see. So, so this gets buggered up, so you need to be able to quickly take that off, reheat it, reforge it, harden and temper it, put the handle back on it, and get back to work. You can't be taking the wedge out, <laughs> right? And if the striker or you hit cockeyed, if this is loose, it doesn't take your hand off. Oh, yeah. So you notice all these tools I use underneath this, this big hammer. What do I do with that thing? Here. It seems like an awfully light tool. The handle. Yeah. Well, that's for a reason. That's so that the shock doesn't... Because uh -huh. if you hit with 900 pounds force on this, yeah, yeah. and yeah. cockeyed, you don't want to take your arm right off. Yeah. Don't panic if you hear something fall. So, okay, so, <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to heat this up. How long will it take to get yellow? Oh, seconds. Not long. What temperature is that? About 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. About 1,000 C. It's very hot. Yeah. So I'll just show you quickly here. And if I go over here, so that's a lot of work for that. But This is called a hardy, and it goes in the hardy hole. I'm going to heat that up a little bit. water to make coke also to keep the fire narrow because the coal is burning out here it's not heating the metal and it's just making clinker and using up coal which is valuable so you keep the fire as small as you can for the job you're doing with a propane forge it's all on all the time so once the forge is roaring you've got to really work fast <laughs> this you can just stop to so, are you ready, Dad? Yep. Do you see what's happening? Oh, yeah. I cut it too. Oh, you did that intentionally. Yep. I want to get a nice... So now we got a fairly square piece here. You never leave that in the anvil because if you come out and do this, you can cut your fingers off. Ooh. 
John. And I'll go like this. That tells Nancy that I'm ready. That's and a signal? That's a signal. We can start. So I put the piece on here and I go, she's ready. And then I hit. And then she hits. So bing, bang, bing, bang. If I hit harder, she hits harder. If I hit softer, she hits softer. If I hit like this, she hits like that. And then when I'm finished, and, and, and as you work, you have to turn the piece to see what you just did. Because when you hammer down this way, you can't see what happened. You need to see from here. So you turn it. So when I turn it, I have to turn it just before I hit. Not before she's about to hit, because she's coming down. That's not fair. Right? Oops, a little too hot there. But you see, that's burning. That's okay. So when I'm ready to finish, I put my hammer down like that, and I wait for one more blow, because you can't ask Nancy to stop on the way down. So I wait for one more blow, bang, and then back into the fire. So, have you got all, did you take notes? <laughs> Every year. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Done. Now look at all that work done. A lot more done than I just did by myself, huh? Right. And you, it's much easier. But you gave don't her ever the big tell, hammer. Don't ever let people tell you this is hard work. It's not hard work. <laughs> you gave her the big hammer. Well. <laughs> I'm not as dumb as I look. <laughs> so, okay. Good. Is that, is that good? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so you do this often? Uh, we do it often for demonstration purposes. Yeah. Uh, when he's working to, to get stuff done, he uses the power hammer. Yeah. So does he help as much in the kitchen as you do in the shop? Uh, nowadays, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not working in the shop so much anymore, so I do have more time for... Uh, wow. Nancy's trying... I, I'm sort of like a sous chef. Sous, sous chef. She lets me chop things. <laughs> Nothing too complicated. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate this, and uh, well, I learned a lot. Good, good, good. It's, it's, it's I, all. If you take nothing away from this, is it's that uh, this is a lot of fun. So where pe where can people find you? Well, I'm here, but I have a I have a big presence on the internet. I have a, there's lots of videos and stuff like that. JohnLittleIronwork.com. Okay. Uh, and there's a video section and a Vimeo section. Is that right? Is it Vimeo? Is that yes. the right word? Uh, yes, but you have to look under more, which is not all. When the website comes up, it's right there, isn't it, though? Look under more anyway. Well, the website comes up, there's architectural sound sculptures. Oh, under, in your website, look under more. And then there's a section called more. Yes. And that's, that's the goal. Where all your videos are. There's some really goofy stuff. <laughs> You know, that big rock over by Piggy's. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a video of the, of the redoing of that. I did that originally 40 years ago yeah. by myself. And we, just before we had this retrospective show in Halifax a few years ago, uh, we decided if we don't redo it with proper stainless steel, we're getting too, we'll be too old. <laughs> so so there's, a, there's the video of the making of that. It's called Levitation. Okay. And, well. Uh, there's all, and there's the solar forging and all that. It's cr there's a lot of crazy stuff there. Well, and the making of a bottle cap lifter. There's a whole video about that. I'll have to come back and, when the weather's better and take a walk around. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, okay. I, I think this is a great project. All right. Yeah. And yeah, that's about as good as it gets. Okay. <laughs> That's the doorbell, eh? I'll go inside and get a video from the inside. This is your gallery? This is, this is kind of neat. Oh, my. Look at the way this thing works. <laughs> 
See, this can't go that way, but it can go this way. So what it does is trip it and then reset. <laughs> so it always goes ding dong. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things. That's a grill for cooking in your fireplace and chair. And these are, these are What's things. with the uh, chairs? Oh, that's a. This, this, that's this one is, of those. This, this will surprise you. Hold your breath now. All right. Like a snake. <laughs> Isn't that something? That was Nancy's Christmas present a few years ago. Never again. Never again. Oh, fun, fun. That one has to go back and forth 60 times in one minute. The next one 59 times. The next one 58 times. You figure that out? No, you don't, I, I don't have the horsepower. You can figure it out, but I can't do the math. So I made the strings adjustable, so I timed it. Tighten the string a little bit, tighten it, don't too much, loosen it a little bit, tighten it, oh. just about right for all of them. It'll be crazy. <laughs> wow. Okay, now, just to, you gotta get this thing here. What thing? This thing here. This? This, this thing here. Looks like a jellyfish. It's a Portuguese man of war. Somebody told me, check out this guy. <laughs> so I went on the internet, found a man named Steve Weiss in Kinkin, Australia, north of uh, Brisbane on the East Coast. What's he doing? He's about my age. He's forging hot steel into shapes like jellyfish and putting them in room dividers, and he plays them with mallets and bows. So I contacted him, and it started an avalanche of correspondence yeah. that continues to this day. <laughs> One day I get an email. All it says is open the attachments, click, click. Two round trip tickets for Nancy and me to come visit in King Ken Australia. We don't travel. Wow. 35 hours each way. And we went to King Ken and we built a sound sculpture. <laughs> wow. Uh, Some adventures. You see, you see, see? I mean, all of this happened because I came to Nova Scotia. Yeah. Met Nancy and became a blacksmith. Is Nancy from here? She's from Montreal originally. Oh. Yeah. City King. What else do you have here? Well, there's, uh, there's some anchors. anchors. Uh, these, these are small uh, that I made just for an exhibition in Halifax. What's that up there? And the, okay, here's here's something that they... Uh, here. Okay. Sorry, I have to do this to you. Just mm -hmm. take this, this is... Oh, yeah. 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 And this is what he discovered in my Amazing. in my work. Wow. I showed this to a friend of mine who is a German scientist, but he's an am uh, amateur astronomer. And he like ran. Yeah. He ran up to his bedroom and brought down a book about. The moons of Jupiter. He said, "Look at this." He said, and it looked just like this. He mm -hmm. said, "Look, George has been there." <laughs> <laughs> and that's George when he he just changed our lives. That man. Okay. So, and there's this is insights. There's insights two and insights three up there. Right. Another time. But you know, I do goofy things too, like now you've seen the process. You can sort of appreciate something like this. It's just the same 
This is called how to get ahead. <laughs> turn, turn around this way so we can get a better lighting. How to get ahead. How to get ahead. <laughs> like I say, if you pound on metal long enough, <laughs> your, your sense of humor. I love these free form sort of things and bowls and all kinds of stuff. You, you, if you go on my website, you'll see there's okay. fences and railings and all kinds of things and. And Umlaw Road, you mentioned Umlaw Road, there's a there's a thousand pound bell that we made here uh, in uh, John Leon's backyard. You know John Leon? No. He's on, on uh, Umlaw Road. It's in a tower. It's a thousand wow. pound bell with a... Uh, it's, it's huge. It's, it's this big around and it's tall and it has great huge tendrils that come out north, south, east and west. And when you hit it with a battery ram, they all quiver. And it just goes on and on for forever. So. All right. Well, this is quite a day. Okay, man. <laughs> you, you're you're released. All right. Thank you.